It is a pleasure to be here. This is the second time in 40 years that I've given a talk in South Dakota, so I kind of neglected you guys anyway, so it's good to be here. But Paul Fixon, my uh, esteemed colleague who lives right down the street here, or works down the street here, uh, is taking care of you pretty well, I think. And then Scott Morell, who's going to follow me, has uh, been in the most recent years, been working here as well once in a while. So hopefully you've been well taken care of by our institute. As uh, David said, I did work for about a year for the Ag Drainage Management Coalition uh, from early 2010 through the end of last year. And with all the expansion in, in drainage and the things going on, they got some grants to uh, further some work there. It got to the point where they were wanting full time and I was wanting to retire and uh, only do a part time job, so we had to, to uh, change ways. But I'm still very supportive of the drainage management ideas and appreciate the chance to share some of those thoughts with you. And uh, we'll get to that discussion in a minute, but I wanted to. Also congratulate the Jackrabbits, uh, at least from some of the people in Illinois, they, they thought they would support you. There's a few folks over in the western part of the state that wouldn't uh, support that comment. But In fact, I was down at the Commodity Classic last weekend too, and I even heard the news down there about western Illinois uh, getting run over by the Jackrabbits. So I guess it was the Jackrabbits that beat them. Somebody in in a meeting or in a game up here anyway. But we uh, just uh, being from Illinois, it's nice to, to visit some place where you actually have winning teams. <laughs> Our line I haven't done very well. In the Big Ten race, Illinois beat the two top, top schools in the conference and they haven't beat anybody else, so go figure. Uh, so I, rather to get into politics, it might be a better one, but I can't uh, top that one either because you, you guys are sending your governor to China next week. We're sending our governor to prison. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't top you in basketball. I can't top you in politics. <laughs> and I'm not sure I can top you in soybeans the way it looks either, but... Uh, while I was down to Commodity Classic, I got to visit with some pretty good uh, corn and soybean growers and wheat growers and sorghum growers and even met a canola growing champion from Alberta. So it was a, a pretty good time. Over 6,000 people attended the Classic this year. And uh, Friday afternoon, we all got pushed into the exhibit hall because they had a tornado alert and uh, didn't think that that glass dome was a good place for everybody to be at that point. So. I worked with Herman Warsaw back in the 70s and 80s and when I moved to Illinois in 1982. I worked with him very closely and he had produced 338 bushels of corn per acre in 1975. And as, as a young researcher at that point at Purdue, I thought that if I'm going to be telling farmers how to manage their crops, I better learn how these top farmers are doing things. So I started getting to know him, and, and eventually when I moved over to Illinois and joined the Potash Institute, I, uh, I worked very closely because I only lived about 20 miles away from him. And really learned that it's paying attention to the details is what his secret was. Nothing magic, no magic potions or formulas or anything. It's paying attention to all the details. And in fact, you could talk to his wife, Evelyn, if, if you wanted to see Herman, she said go out to the cornfield because he's out there every day. That's all he does. And uh, so that may be part of the story. Kip Cullors, uh, highest soybean yield that I'm aware of, 100 and, had 154, and I think he beat that last year, or two years ago, at 160 some bushels per acre. So it tells us there's potential out there in those soybean plants that we're, we're not tapping completely. Uh, it was fun this weekend uh, at the corn conference and the corn banquet to uh, shake hands with David Hula. He's a farmer in Virginia that I've worked with off and on the last few years and David produced 429 bushel per acre corn this year. And he just sent me an email, I wish I could have got a picture on the slides here of that corn, but David's about my height and he was standing there and the ears were up higher than his head. 
on this corn. And I think it was around 42,000 plants per acre, pretty high population. And uh, he harvested it 25% uh, moisture because he got a weather report that the hurricane was coming up the, the east coast. He's out in Virginia, just north of Norfolk. And uh, in fact, he farms a farm, a farm that was, was the first farm, farm in the United States, United States that, was that was started, started by, by Captain John Smith and his colony, uh, his colonists, uh, his colonists in uh, 1610. 1610. So, uh, so uh, this, particular this particular field is just a, a little, little ways down, down the road, the road uh, from, from where the, from where the first farm, farm in the United States, States was. But anyway, but anyway, David, David got, got this report, report that the hurricane was coming up, and he knew he had some good corn out there, so they went out and harvested. He got the 429 bushels. The next, the next day, day the hurricane hit, hit and after it went over, it got, got in, in and, and, they and they harvested the rest of the field. Of the field. And, it was and it was laying flat, flat as a table, as a table. and, and uh, pick, pick, was, able was able to pick up 350 bushels per acre. So I said, so I said how, how do you turn, you turn this, this in on crop insurance? Who's going to believe an 80 bushel per acre claim when you've already taken in 350? So anyway. Anyway. I really, I really like, like this, this idea of a yield challenge, and I uh, hope that you, that you guys continue to, to, support to support that and work with it. With it. It, gives it gives you something to talk about, about, about if nothing, nothing else. It gives us something to think about and work on and, uh, and, uh, and, and give us a challenge. challenge. Tomorrow, Tomorrow, I happen to have the opportunity to meet in Illinois with their yield challenge group, which is trying to do the similar type thing. They have a contest set up where you have to have a team of five farmers minimum. Some of them Some have, have 10 or 12, and they, they, they pick the top five, five for their contest. contest. And, these and these teams compete for uh, prizes similar, similar to what you're talking about. about. They can do they whatever, whatever they want to. They, they don't, don't all have to do the same, same thing in the team, but, but, every, but every member of the team has, has to have a five-acre five plot, plot that they harvest and, and, do, and this. do this. So I'm going to try to listen to some of your secrets here and take them back to Illinois and see if they can learn how to grow soybeans there. Same way you do, at least. We're, uh, we're, uh, working I'm working with a particular, particular group, group there that's going to, going to take, take it a step, step further and do an environmental challenge. challenge. We're not only, we're not only going to look at yield, yield, but we're also going to look at the environmental impact that we have uh, with, uh, with the practices they're using. So that'll be, that'll be interesting, interesting too. too. Mostly, Mostly been, been focused, focused on corn, on corn for, my for my career, but we have to, we have think, to think about corn and soybeans as part of the system where I live. In Illinois, it's about a 50-50 most years. A little heavier on corn now, but... You gotta look you gotta at look both, both crops, crops and how they contribute to the, to the system, system because what you do, what you do on, soybeans on soybeans affects the corn, the corn crop and the same with the corn affecting the soybean crop. And those, and those, are, all those are all pieces that we need to look, to look at. at. And getting, and getting on, to on to the subject, the subject uh, drainage is one of those things, things. At, least at least where I live. I grew up, I grew up not thinking, not thinking any different. The tile is just part of life. In fact, one of the early things I remember is is watching, is watching the bulldozers, the bulldozers put in a surface, surface drain, drain because the tile couldn't take all the water off. off and we put, we put these grass, grass waterways in to get the water off the surface, surface. So, we so we had time, time to get the, the tile, the tile to, work to work and get the rest of the water off. We had we about, about a 44-inch per year annual rainfall, and, and a lot of that, lot of that comes in the spring, so it keeps us out of the field if we can't get a drain. It's just impossible to grow a crop without it where we live. In fact, in Champaign, in Champaign County, County uh, near, uh, near Monticello, Monticello Pyatt County, where I live, the early, the early maps from the mid-1800s mid just, just had a big area, area there that they said was malaria-infested malaria swamps. swamps and wasn't used for production at all. Nobody lived there. And this guy, John Deere, came in and figured out how to, to break up the prairie grass that was about 15 feet tall there. And the uh, tile drainage people came in from from Europe, uh, the Dutch and German settlers, which is mostly what we have around there, they knew how to, to drain the wetlands like they'd done in, in Holland, so uh, they were able to drain the land and, and turn it into production, and now most of that land's been farmed about 150 years or, or so. So that's what I want to talk about is kind of how that all came about. Drainage really has shaped the land, at least where I live, and, and it uh, sets the stage for for the, for the future of sustainable, sustainable production, production systems. And, uh, and uh, you see, the, see the tile drainage outlet, outlet there, there coming out, coming out of the field. field. Most, Most of our tile are about uh, three and a half, three and a half to four and a half feet, feet deep. And then they, and then they drain, drain into a, a, surface, a surface, which in this case, in this case is a dredge, dredge ditch. ditch. And that means, that means it, was, it was dug out, dug out with a dredge machine. And 
in the early, in the early days, days, the tile, the tile were all put in by hand. hand. Imagine, Imagine putting, putting all these, all these thousands, thousands of, of feet, thousands, thousands, thousands of miles, really, of tile. It was all, it was all dug by, by hand, hand. But, but the dredges, dredges made, the, made drains. the drains. And some of these, some of these were natural streams that were, that were cleaned out and straightened and so forth. And some of them, there was no outlet, so they just dug a, a trench across the, the fields to do it. This is what uh, last spring we had some some of the land uh, down the road from where I live looked like. We're kind we're of kind flat, of flat prairie, prairie there, there uh, most of most the of the time, but uh, we, have we have these wet spots. spots and this is this one is of one of the things that shaped the land is is, is those, those wet spots and those, those uh, uh, we got black top soil, soil because of the organic, organic matter that's from, from all the thousands of years of, of grasses. grasses. What we've, what we've learned now with precision, precision farming, farming technology, technology though, especially yield, yield monitors yield and yield maps, is that is that, that wet spot that you see is only part of, part of it. And there's, and there's five, five or ten acres, acres around every acre of that wet spot. Of that wet spot. There's, there's five or ten acres, acres that the yield, that the yield has been decreased as well. As well. And as a result, uh, yield maps have probably, we started thinking, well, that's going to help us sell more fertilizer because we can show the benefits of higher yields. What we've done is sold a whole lot more tile because it's, proven that you can't do anything unless you're getting that uh, drainage off of there. Another thing that shaped our landscape like it did here is the glaciers. And, and the most, the most significant one probably is that blue line, line which is, which is the, the, uh, the Wisconsin glacier, glacier that was somewhere, somewhere in the, in the 65, 65 to 10,000 years ago. And there's, and there's a, lobe a lobe up there, up there on uh, uh, western, western Wisconsin, Wisconsin that's, that's it's called, it's called the, the driftless, driftless area. area. That area, the, the Wisconsin, Wisconsin glacier, glacier didn't through. come through. And you get over, you get over in that area around Galena, Illinois, Illinois and north, and north there's uh, some really some rough, rough land and some tall, tall almost, almost like, like mountains in that area of Wisconsin, Wisconsin Minnesota, Minnesota, northern Iowa, northern, northern Illinois. Illinois. But that, but that uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin glacier, glacier left some really, really good soils that, that, that uh, goes across most of the eastern half of South Dakota, across northern Iowa. The northern, the northern part, part of, of Illinois, Illinois Indiana, Indiana, Ohio, Ohio and, so forth. and so forth. Dug out, dug the, out the Great Lakes, lakes it uh, formed, formed the Mississippi, Mississippi River Basin, Basin. all those things are part of it. Part of it. <laughs> so that was a significant thing that uh, for the last 10,000 years, we've had soils developing under that uh, last glacier. If you think about that, these uh, glaciers were somewhere between one and 3,000 feet thick. That was a, that lot, was a of lot of ice. Now this, now this is, is an aerial, aerial photograph, photograph. I, shot I shot of one when I was traveling through there. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, I, 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 was, I was over in speaking, speaking at a conference, conference in Greece last summer, summer and coming back, coming back we went, we went across Greenland, Greenland and this is what the glacier looks like up there. And same, same kind of, kind of a massive, massive ice sheet, sheet is what we had over this area. And it's just looking out of the airplane window, it's pretty striking as far as you can see a huge sea of ice. And what's, and what's left, left uh, this is, this from, is the from the Farm Progress Show at Decatur, Decatur Illinois, Illinois, which is about, about, about 15, 15 miles, miles from where I live. live. And, and uh, uh, this, would this would be the drummer soil, soil, which is the, the, the great, great the, or the soil, the official, the official soil of Illinois, Illinois I guess. We've got, we've got a lot of acres of it. And we've, and got, and we've got this underground till, which was formed by the glaciers. And then above it, we got the windblown deposits. And some, and of, some of that probably came, came from South Dakota, Dakota when the wind blew it across there, here, when all, when all this land was, was barren, barren and, and, and uh, drifted, drifted into big, big hills, hills in Iowa. Iowa. By the time, By the time it, it got to Illinois, Illinois it wasn't making as much hills, hills but we still, we still have a, a couple of feet of that windblown material in some places. And then that has developed over the years of uh, under grass. Normally that area would be a a uh, climax ve vegetation there would be an oak hickory forest, but the native uh, Indians that were, were living in that area kept it burned off so the buffalo could come in and, and graze on the grass. And so by keeping the grass growing and not letting trees in, we got a lot deeper and blacker soils because you get a lot more uh, organic matter deposited from a grass topography or grass growth than you do from trees. So those are all combinations of things that uh, have developed our, our soils, and that's all important to our discussion about drainage and, and water management. And of course, the bison, uh, Buffalo, buffaloes, we call them, 
This actually, this actually is a picture I shot up in North Dakota, Dakota, Dakota a couple of years ago, where you can, where you can just drive up to them and, and say, and say hi. hi. Biggest, biggest cows I'd ever seen. But it's, but it's, it's, it's uh, pretty, pretty neat to see because, see because they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty, neat pretty neat animals. animals. We don't, we see, don't them see them a lot in Illinois. Illinois. I guess you have them around South, South Dakota and places too. Um, um, but this helped shape our landscape over several hundred years as the, the natives you know, kept the trees off. It also helped because these, these buffalo got into the wet spots where we had poor drainage and they wallered around to keep cool in the hot summers and then they carried that mud out and that left all these pockets and they call them buffalo wallows. You probably have the same thing around here. And huge uh, drainage problems in, in much of our landscape. So again, that helped shape the landscape. Another thing that helped was the iron horse. When these, when these steam, steam engines started, started coming in, they brought, they brought a couple of couple things, things that, that uh, changed, changed it forever. And that would, and that be, would the be the machinery and the tile and the, and the people that uh, were able, were able to bring, bring in, in the drainage systems, systems and, and start, start putting them together. together. So all, those all those kind of, kind of things, things happened in the last, in the last 50 years, years of the 1800s. And there's, and there's factors, factors today, today that are shaping the environment. The environment. As we grow, we grow these higher, these higher, and higher, and higher corn, corn yields, soybean, soybean yields, 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 we're changing, we're changing the, soil the soils again. again. We're also, we're also demanding, demanding that we have a better environment to grow those, grow those kinds of yields, and drainage, and drainage becomes, becomes even more important. So, so uh, as I look out, I look out the, the, down the road from my house here, here and saw the, saw the sun coming up one morning, I thought it was a neat picture to show, kind of give you some thoughts about the new era that's ahead of us. And we're seeing more and more of the, the big farms. Uh, I know maybe a five or 10,000 acre farms aren't a big thing out here in the, the plains, but in Illinois, we used to have 160 acre farms, and now we're in the, the five and 10,000 acre farms to be a viable operation in many cases. And we have some 50 and 60,000 acre farms too. So those kinds of things are changing. Well, to get into the drainage topic, uh, We've gone to the subsurface drainage, which puts really the really goal, the goal is, to is to build a better, better root system. system. What, we're, what trying we're trying to do is, is under, under with undrained situations, situations in the spring, spring we, have we have a free water, water table that's up at or, at or near the surface. The surface. And if we, and if we don't have a way, have a way to get rid of that, that, that limits how deep the roots can grow. It'll be dry maybe in the top few inches, but the roots will go into free water. So if, so if that, that water, water table is high, is high that, limits that limits how deep the roots can go, means it, means it also, also limits how the nutrients supply, supply that they can take and so forth. If the if free, free water level is down lower in the, in summer, the summer, then, then uh, if, the if, the if the roots didn't get established early, early it, may it may be hard once, once they get up to tasseling stage. You don't get a lot of new root growth going down deeper in the soil. Again, I apologize for my pictures being corn for a soybean group think soybeans, they, they do some of the same things. A little different root system though. But with the tile drain systems, we can lower that water table early so the early roots will go deeper. And then later in the summer when the free water level is lower, the tile are maybe not flowing anymore, but the roots have already established. And as they're working on producing more grain up in the top, they've got a bigger root system to bring up water and nutrients to keep that crop alive. So. What we're trying to do is uh, avoid the limits on early root development that we get with having wet feed in the field. Generally, generally the, there's, there's a, a kind, kind of a, slope, slope, a sloping, sloping dome, dome between the tile line, so, so it, it, drains it drains out where the, where the tile, tile is down to the depth where the tile, where the tile is, located. is located. In between, in between you, you get kind of an elevated, elevated uh, water, uh, water status. status. I got some other pictures that show that a little different. And then, of and then, of course, we've got the mains that these tile, tile lines, lines flow, 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 flow into. But how do, we, how get do we get to the point of having, having this kind of a, a, a network of drainage systems? systems. One, of the, One things of the things we have what we call drainage, drainage districts. And this was, I don't know, politics, I'm sure, played a big role in those days, too. But it was a smart thing that our forefathers did in setting up these drainage districts so that the farmers, and at that point it was mostly agricultural people. We didn't have a lot of cities, people uh, controlling things. Like in Illinois, you can't get anything done now except voting in, about stuff in Chicago, but uh, you don't have quite that problem here maybe. But uh, the drainage districts allowed farmers to work together 
to develop these drainage Station systems, put in the main Agency lines, and, and uh, board of directors. developped a taxing and body. This is an official government to agency, and they, they and form a board of directors, uh, and they vote, that and they can levy here, taxes to support and the building Hawaii and maintenance of those outlets. Some some I, I don't know that you have those out here. Uh, I know in to cooperate. Illinois has them. Uh, uh, some states have them, some don't. Do any good unless but that was a key thing in, in getting everybody to cooperate. To to because uh, if you drain your farm, it doesn't do any good unless the water's got a place to go. And you often have, have some to go legal powers, a few uh, miles across other people's land to get to an outlet. They're forcing you to... To go along, but they can they have some legal powers. I, I don't know if you'd say they have powers of condemnation or forcing or you to, cases, maybe to go along, but they can put some pressure on at least. But it was a key to the success. Helps to facilitate or in some cases maybe force cooperation yeah. among landowners. Here's a but it was a key to the success of, the of getting that network of drainage in systems in together. They were building Here's a a lake as a an example of one of the dredges. This one happened to be in the city of Urbana. They were building a lake as a part of the drainage system there, just kind of dammed up a, a section and, and dredged it out of a stream that was going through there. The these guys that were working the, on that actually lived on the dredge machine. They had this house that the interesting was thing was that these guys that were working on that actually lived on the dredge machine. They had this house that, that floated along with it. And that'll be the case with several of these pictures I've got. Here's one of the early uh, tile ditching machines. A little, a little different from what we use today. today. This is this one, is one that, uh, that uh, they used for digging the dredges. And, and you can see they've got, got a series, series of, boards of boards that they float, they float along, along while they're right, right along on because this was a wet, a wet muddy, muddy, swampy, swampy land, land that they were going through. And they're putting, and they're putting in some pretty good sized pipes there. In this dipper dredge, they called it, would dip the soil out and make the the ditch and then move on down the line. This is a this little, is a little different, different approach. approach. This, this one actually, actually floated. floated. And as it and dug, dug a trench, trench in front, in front the water, the water came, came in behind, and the machine, and the machine floated, floated down, 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 down the, 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 the ditch as it was building, building it. it. Another, Another example of one that had a rail, rail and, and they, it's, it's not a very long rail. rail. They just would pick it up and move it as it moved forward. And, and kept digging, kept digging the, the, trench the trench along the way. The way. And, again, and again, there's quarters, quarters up there where the, the, guys, the guys could sleep and live. It's another, it's another shot, shot of one that was being used about, being used about 100 years ago. ago. See that See horse, horse was up to its knees, knees in swamp, swamp land, land there, too. And you can, and you see, can the see the living quarters back in the back. It looked like probably not the Ritz-Carlton. Probably not even a good Holiday Inn. But they drug their house along with them as they were going down through these trenches in the field. Turning that swamp into farmland. Some of the Some best, of the best farmland, farmland in the world, the world now that used to be totally, to be totally unfarmable. And here's, and here's some, some of the, of the different, different kinds, kinds of tile, of tile that were put in. in. Uh, started, started in 1821, 1821 dividing the, the land, land into townships, townships and then shortly, shortly after, after that's when they started building, building the... Uh, the plans, the plans to, to well, the, well, the railroads came in and so forth. And so forth. Um, I think, I think it was here around, around 1870 they had the, the, drainage, the drainage laws, laws were put, put into effect. effect. The, the, the tile, tile was in 1865. 1865. A lot of, a lot these, of these were initially, were initially built, built by brickyards. Brick and here's, and here's some, some of the flat, flat bottom ones. ones. These, are these are basically bricks that just had a hollowed out section. Out section. They'd turn, they'd turn one, one upside down, down and they, like you like stack, stack bricks, bricks, they just stacked them down through the field, the field and, and, made, and a made a channel, channel for the drainage, drainage to go through. And we, and we still find those as we dig up old uh, tile lines or put in new ones. We still find some of these are still functioning after 150 years. A little closer shot of them. The Mississippi, the Mississippi River, River system, system is is, is uh, uh, probably, probably the, the biggest, biggest area for, for, drainage for drainage systems in the, in the US, US and most of it's centered around the what we call, what we call the Corn Belt area. area. But there's, but there's a lot, a lot of water, of water. It, all it all drains down, down to this one spot down, spot down by New Orleans. In the, the area that's, that's now causing, causing the concern, concern about hypoxia and the nitrates that come in. And it's because we're concentrating all of the water that comes out of all this area into one spot and depositing anything that it carries with it. 
Now this now is, this a is a little bit, bit older, older picture. It's from 1992, and there's been some big changes recently going on of, of where, where these, these subsurface, subsurface drains are. are. Big, big section, section very, very intensely drained in eastern, eastern Indiana, Indiana uh, western uh, Ohio. Ohio. I was, I was over in that area last, last summer, summer, and big concern, big concern there is the phosphate that goes, goes into Lake Erie, Erie from that. And we went out on Lake Erie on a boat and saw the intense green stuff that was coming in there, and I can see why they're concerned about it. And similar things, the hypoxia problem down here is what we're concerned about. But what's happening is northern Iowa, southern Minnesota, and on into the Dakotas here, big area of expansion of drainage now. I think partly because we've had a shift in rainfall patterns. You guys have been getting a little more rainfall more recently than we used to. And, uh, but we're having very intense uh, increase in drainage in, in the center part of Illinois here too. So I would guess a lot of these counties are, are red if we uh, had the same map now. Today, uh, the, systems the systems that we have, have are faster, faster and easier to install. To install. The, using, using a plastic, plastic tile, tile is cheaper, cheaper by the foot, foot has, a has a longer useful, useful life, and, 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 in, and general, in general, we're draining more intensely. intensely instead of putting these, these uh, lines, lines 150 feet, feet, feet apart, apart, a lot of them are going in at 30 feet, feet apart. apart. Uh, a little bit, a little bit shallower, shallower depth in some cases. But, but they're still no smarter. And, and they drain, they drain 24, 24 hours, hours a day, seven, seven days, days a week, 365 five days a year, except, except when it's frozen. frozen. And, and uh, uh, that's not, that's always, not a always a good idea. idea. Even in our area, we get into a couple weeks or a month every summer when we'd like to hold some of that water back. And that's a concern I think it'd be good for you folks to think about uh, because you have a drier climate, you have more intense droughts uh, periods and so forth. Managing that, how fast that water goes off may be important too. For us and for you, I'm sure it's important to get it off early to be able to get the crop out in a timely fashion, have good emergence of, of plants and so forth. But then later in the summer, we may like to turn it off and, and keep it from draining as much. So, so that's what I wanted to visit with you about a little bit here is some of the things that uh, are doing along that line. Now here's here's a, a, modern a modern tile. tile uh, uh, unit, unit that, that uh, this, uh, this wheel, wheel turns, turns and digs, digs the hole, and, and, it's, and it's got this big, big uh, trench, trench thing, thing and the tile, the tile drop in behind it on, on, on a big, big plastic, plastic roll, roll now instead, now instead of individual, individual tiles. tiles. By the way, By the way I, was I was teaching, teaching a class up in northern Indiana, Indiana when I was at Purdue one time, and I had, I had a group of students gave a lecture on drainage and. Talked about, about installing, installing tile and how important, important it was and everything. After, After class, a group of, group of the students came up and said, this, this was interesting, interesting but we're confused about how, how putting, putting tile on a field, field is going to help the drainage. The drainage. Wouldn't that just seal it over? And they were, and they were think, thinking about, about the floor, floor tile that we use. <laughs> so the so next, next week, week I had to take some samples up and show them what we were talking about. Sometimes you have to be able to communicate. This was this down, was down the, uh, just, just a half mile, mile down the road from where I live. Farmer, farmer I think there's almost, almost a full section that they were putting in. And he, and he had a lot, lot of rolls of these big plastic spaghetti spaghettis that they're putting out in the field. field. And it, and it looked like he was putting these on about a 60 foot center uniform grid across the whole field. So that's what we're doing with a lot of them now is putting a uniform grid in instead of just one tile that goes to the wet spot to drain it. And of course, uh, the other thing that's come into play is the use of lasers and, and GPS to guide this so we can control the depth with the lasers and GPS to control geographically where it goes and to document where they are. We have all these tiles put in in the last 150 years that nobody has a clue where they are in some cases. And we go in, uh, we start putting in a new system, we find there's already a system there that nobody knew about. So they've done their job fairly well. We also have a goal of uh, the ag drainage industry of doing, doing enough, enough to, to ensure, ensure the trafficability and, and, and crop, crop production, but not, but not take, take off, off any more than we need to. We want to, we want to conserve, conserve that resource because, because the water is important to us and also the nutrients that go off the field with the water are important. And that's, and that's all part of the, of the, of the system, system of managing your 
drainage, the drainage water. water. Here's, Here's another, another diagram, diagram showing between the tile lines, lines the, pattern, the pattern, and you and get, you get uh, uh, ISO, ISO lines, lines forming, forming here uh, between, between the, uh, the, uh, water the water potential, potential in the soil, the gradient, gradient basically, basically that's set, set up between, between the, the, amount the amount of water that's, that's in each part of the field. Of the field. And, that and that affects how the lines, lines flow. flow. So, so the water, water flows, flows from this point, point like this to the tile, and over, and over here in the center, center it flows down the lower level and comes up from the bottom to get in. I don't understand the hydrology well enough to explain all the details of that, but there's some important Things, things that, that you need to do, need to do. Getting, getting a good engineer, engineer that understands that, that to, help to help you design these systems is very important. And it's not always what you think from a logical standpoint is the right way to go. Uh, experience and engineering technology tells us that you need to follow some of the rules to get it done right. The future, as I, as as I said, said uh, more, and more, more and more we're going to pattern, pattern tiled systems. systems. That helps, that helps us because, because it also helps us if we want to control the water loss. Uh, we, find we find that it's not just the wet spot that you can see, but the whole field that's affected by drainage, drainage problems. So this, so this is, is one way we can correct that. that. We, put we put up a grid, up a grid and then we, these, these different colors represent different, uh, different uh, zones, and we, and we can turn those on and off depending on how much water we want to take out of certain parts of the field. We put a control structure over here on the main and, uh, and uh, it can control all, all the laterals, laterals that feed in. into it. Depends, Depends on the topography and how, and how flat the field is and so forth, uh, just how you design, you design that. If you're, if you're in a sloping field, field instead of going a uniform parallel grid, grid you, you need to run these, these lines parallel, parallel to the contours. contours. A lot of people used to run them up and down the hills. We don't want to do that. We want to run them parallel to the contours for every foot elevation change you probably need a uh, structure. And in fact, these control structures, we like to put uh, one of those in about every foot and a half in elevation change, so sometimes they need to be fairly close together. Again, you need to work with an engineer that, that knows the technology. The way those work in a normal conventional drainage system, the tile drains, drains the water, the water out, out to the to depth, the depth of, the of the tile. With, with the, the control, control drainage, drainage, we put a structure, a structure in there that's, that's basically, basically a little dam. dam. We drop, we drop slots, slots uh, just boards, boards that drop into a slat, and they sometimes are plastic logs or whatever, logs or whatever they might be. But, but they, raise they raise the, the, water, the water up, so, so it has to flow over, over this dam before it gets out into the, the outlet. So you put, so you put these, these fairly close, close to the outlet, outlet whether it's a main, main or a, a stream, stream or whatever it might be. And then, you then you can adjust by putting a different number of boards in there, moving the boards up and down, how high the water table is. So early in the spring, we drop it down, we raise it up during the summer to hold the water back and we drop it in the fall for harvest. Here's one of the, the structures under installation. This is in a, looks, looks like about, about a 10, 10 probably a 10 inch, inch main. main. So it's, so it's a fairly, fairly that's, a, that's, that's not a midget, midget out, out there. He's, He's a pretty good sized guy. guy. And, this and this is where the, the, the slots are for, are for the boards, boards to go down and, and, stop, and it. stop it. So in the winter time, we hold it up and hold the water table up so that uh, we, can we can keep, keep it, in, it the in the soil. In the spring, in the spring uh, maybe, maybe about, about this time, we'd start dropping that down, let the water flow out so we can get in and, and, do, the and do the field work. work. Then in the, in the summer, summer, we raise, we raise it up a little bit to hold the water table up, but not too high, too high that it restricts root zones. And then, and then again in the fall, we drop it down for harvest. And these things, as this one is, can be electronically controlled, controlled solar, solar powered, powered and you can control, control it with your computer, computer or, cell or cell phone from your office if you want to. Uh, you can spend as much money on these as you'd like, I guess. And the uh, basic installation costs about 10% uh, more than the cost of putting in a tile system for most fields. If the more controls you put on, that'll raise the price a little bit too. But you don't have to go with all that. You can do it by hand and you only have to change those maybe three or four times a year so you don't have to, it's not like you have to monitor it every day. But here's one of the installations uh, on, a on a farm over by Champagne, Champagne that they have, they have the, the, the solar, solar powered. powered. Actually, Actually this, this one was up in uh, southern, southern Minnesota, Minnesota I guess, where I took this one. It's got, it's a, got radio a radio so you can control, control it by, by uh, 
it sends, it sends the data, the data back, back to your office, and you can also control uh, how, how, deep, how deep you set the water table. Here's, Here's one over by Crawfordsville, Indiana, 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 where they've got, got a paired, paired system. system. This one, this one because, because of the lay of the land, the, this the laterals, laterals go north, north and south, south for the most part, and this one they go mostly east and west. west. There's, a There's a control structure there at each of the red dots, and he can, and he can control, control those individually, individually depending on the growing, growing conditions. conditions. As we go through the season in January, we can keep the water table high, then uh, we drop it down in February, February or around, around the 1st of March here, here through, through April, April, May. May let it, let it low, low, and then middle of, middle of June, we start raising it up to hold the water up during the dry, dry part, part of the summer, then drop it again in the fall. And, uh, and uh, we, track we track the, the rainfall, rainfall, we track the level of the water, and, and, and monitor this. this. I've got some data here later. I'll show you how we summarize all that and the effects of it. Uh, ADMC, ADMC, the Ag Drainage Management Coalition, had a grant from NRCS, from NRCS to study this technology. This technology. And, and over a three-year three period from 2007 to 2009, we just finished analyzing the data last fall, um, we had a 35 percent reduction in water flow over 20 sites in these five states. And that led to a 34.4 percent reduction in nitrate losses, yield increase on the average of 1.3 percent. Um, not a lot, a lot to get excited about on the yield. We had, we had some, some individual, individual fields and that, and that, that had 20% yield increase, though. So it was a very, very significant, significant in the cases, cases where we had, had, had the, a, need a need for getting, getting rid of the water, water or, for or for holding it back, it back as the case may be. But this one about holding back the nitrates is important, too. Not only because it helped protect the Gulf of Mexico, but that's nitrogen that the farmer would be losing that he's paid for and we might as well keep it in the field and use it. My philosophy is we're probably over the, the next 20 years we're going to be sending a lot more nitrogen down the river because we're going to have to use more of it to grow more crops. But I'd like to keep it inside the barges in the grain instead of letting it in the just float down the river in the water. So That was supposed to be a joke but I guess it's not funny. <laughs> And he say, well, my fields are rolling, so I can't use that kind of system. And for the most part, it fits well on flat fields. But um, this is a new device that they've put together. Put together. Uh, it's actually the Ag Drainage, drainage uh, or AgriDrain Corporation, Corporation developed, developed these floats. floats. And, and you put, put this little cylinder, cylinder in the field, and it's, and it's buried, buried underground. You never have to look at it again. again. But, it's, but got it's got a series of floats in here, in here and you put one of these... For every, for every foot, foot and a half difference in elevation. In elevation. And, and you set, you set your, your structure up to uh, uh, hold the water table, table say at this point. point. Of course, of course you, you get a fairly, fairly level water table, table up to there. there. And then and you, then put, you one put one of these structures, structures in. in. As, As the water backs up there, there these, these floats shut off the water flow. And then we raise the water table the same amount in the next area. And we get up to the next foot of elevation and we put another one in. We can, we can just stair-step stair step right, right up the field, field that way. Again, I don't understand all the hydrology uh, mathematics on it, but it seems to work, and uh, it's a way to, to put these systems in on what we used to think we, were not, we weren't able to do, control drainage. The rest of the story is, uh, I don't know what the case in South Dakota is, but in, in Illinois right now, uh, Farmers can get from NRCS, they can get a, a cash uh, payment for hiring a technical service provider to put these, or design one of these systems. I think you can get up to uh, between fourteen and $1,700 to hire this technical provider. Uh, so that takes a big bite out of the cost of designing the system. And then there are some programs through EQIP and uh, some other, I forget all the acronyms, but uh, there are some other programs that, depending on the state and the county rules, that you can get cost sharing and even help to install and to manage the structures. And if you want to hire a crop consultant to help you design or help you manage it over the years, there may be even some programs there. So uh, they are trying to promote it. NRCS has made this a 
priority item for the next uh, few years here. They assigned the state conservationist in, in North Dakota is in charge of that program and uh, working with the other state cons in the Midwest to try to, to implement it and try to get more farmers to participate. This shows, this shows the areas, areas where the greatest, greatest opportunity for this, for this kind, kind of system are, are just, just because of the, the uh, lay, of lay of the land and, and the type of crops we're growing. Uh, basically, uh, basically the, the number percentage, percentage of row crops is, is what is this, this is. is. And, and I, again, again, I think this, this is, is a few years old, and this, this whole uh, corn belt area and area of drainage is moving to the north and to the west. Another, Another concept, concept that I uh, wanted to visit about is the riparian, riparian buffers. buffers. Uh, uh, let's do, do this real quickly. quickly. A, lot a lot of these, as I showed in the earlier picture, the tile lines come through and there's a buffer strip along here that was designed to uh, filter, filter out the nitrates, nitrates and phosphates, phosphates before it got into the water. When the, when the tile, tile line goes right through it, that sort of defeats the purpose. So a lot of these are fairly long and narrow. And what, and what we're doing, doing is we put a tile line down, down the length of this, of this and, one and one of the control systems in just, just before where it goes into the stream. stream, and we use that filter strip to filter the nutrients out of the tile line. And it works something like this. That the water comes in from the, the laterals, laterals to the main, main control, control structure, structure raises, raises the water, the water table in that zone, zone the plants, the plants that, are that are growing in the water, water or in the buffer, buffer zone, zone use, use the nitrates, nitrates and, the and the water flows out. out. We have we one, have of, one of these that's been installed in Iowa, Iowa. And, at and at this point, point uh, through, through at least, at least uh, winter, uh, winter here, they had, they had removed 100 percent of the nitrates out of the tile line that was coming into that, so it's very, it's very good. good. And, if and if this continues to look like it's going to work, we have a couple million miles of those kinds of buffers that were put in over the last 10 years or so. And we, and we can use that, that as, as a, a fairly, fairly inexpensive, inexpensive way to get the nitrates, nitrates cleaned up out of, out of our systems. We're, we uh, have a project we're working with the Argonne National Labs in Batavia, Illinois. It's the uh, Department of Energy, but they're interested in growing biofuels crops on these buffers. So you can take the biofuels, take those crops off, use them for biofuels, and we got a, another use for them as well. Um, Again, they had some trials out in Nebraska that uh, removed at least 90% of the nitrates from the water out there, and there's some pretty high nitrates in the Nebraska tile lines. So, some new technology that looks like it makes sense. Uh, Cornell University has developed some new uh, varieties of poplar and willows that are very fast growing and will develop a lot of biomass and remove a lot of nitrates for you. Plus, this is a good vegetation for wildlife, and uh, that's a, a very much a positive, too. And you can get some cost sharing from the National Fish and Wildlife Federation in some cases, or Pheasants Forever and some of those groups. Here's what the installation in Iowa. They ran this down right along the cornfield through the buffer. The stream is over on the other side of the trees here. We have trees and then a grass buffer. We ran this thing about 1,000 feet long. Put in, put in the tile, the tile structure, structure where the, the, the main comes across. across. This is an aerial view of it. And we put, and we put in, in some sampling, sampling wells, wells between the, uh, the, the, this, this distribution line and the stream. And by the, and by the, time, the time we got, we got to this second sampling, sampling well, well, these are, I think, about 50 or 20 feet apart, apart I'm not sure. Uh, um, all, the all the nitrates, nitrates were gone, gone by the time we got to that point anyway. So is, so is this system, system something, something that you want to do? Uh, that's, that's a question, question that, that, that we all have to ask. Uh, farmers' questions are, okay, I, can I apply for financial and technical assistance? Yes, there are programs for that. You can get help in installing the practices. Generally, the farmer is going to pay some, some out-of-pocket costs in, in, this, in this, depending, depending on, the on the system. system. You, will you will sacrifice some tillable acres, acres but you'll make, make some of the acres, acres that, that you are farming more efficient as well. Uh, you have, you to, have maintain to maintain and manage the structures, the structures and there is some cost to that. that. There, there may be, be uh, on the plus side, side there may be some ecosystem markets developing where uh, you, you could do some trading of your, of your investment, investment in, in, in holding back, back nitrates. nitrates. You, you might be able to trade, uh, get, get paid, paid by, by some 
polluter, some, some industry that wants to or needs, or needs to keep, to keep uh, letting water out. Maybe it's a municipality, a city water treatment plant, or whatever it might be. So there, so there are some possibilities there. But a lot of, a lot of farmers are saying, saying okay, I grow corn and soybeans for a living. Now you want to need to build and operate a water treatment facility, too. So. Tough questions to answer, but uh, some interesting possibilities. And as you're moving forward and adding drainage as a bigger component to your production systems, I just encourage you to take a look at this drainage management technology and how it might fit in your operation. It's not for everybody, but if you put in a system that could use it, you don't design it properly, you can't retrofit later. So even if you don't want to put in the control structures now, design the system so it could be put in later. There's, There's my, my contact, contact information. I'd be happy to, to visit, visit with you or send, send me an email or, or there's some, some websites, websites there that you can go to also, also for additional, additional information. information. A, lot a lot of the, the uh, slides, slides I got came, came from the Ag Drainage, Drainage Management, Management Coalition, Coalition and uh, they're, uh, they're a good source, source of information, information too. Any questions? Any questions? Over here. Over here. Yes. Those talking about all these nitrates coming down the tile lines. Are these open, these have inlets on them or? Yeah, the, the water just coming into your tile lines. It's not percolating through the soil into the tile, it's going through the open inlets? No, it, it'll percolate from the soil. And it may not be from the fertilizer you applied. Just the natural decay of organic matter over the years releases nitrates. Uh, I think I remember somebody here at South Dakota State had some studies a few years ago, Dave, I'm not sure who it was. Uh, over the last 80 years, the organic levels had been going down once they started tilling the prairies. And that's just a natural thing. The moral plots at the University of Illinois have been in production for about 140 years now. It took about 50 years before the organic matter level leveled off again, and the nitrates stopped leaching out at that point. So. It's a natural phenomena. If you have inlets, yes, that is a source for some to can as well. Anybody else? Time for maybe one or two more questions before we go to break. Yes. This grid tiling you're talking about, have many people reverse the water, pump water back up in more dry years? Yeah, I should have mentioned that uh, 25 years ago or so, there were a lot of systems being put in there in central Illinois called the Iridrain system. They put those a little shallower, about 35, 36 inches deep, and they were four inch tiles and didn't have as much slope on them, but they could pump water back in. And uh, one farm I've been working with has a big tank that they put in then, and they could pump the water back in during dry, dry weather. Another guy's pumping it in just from a pond. Uh, one caution is that since it's not flowing very much, they tend to sill in. And that first one that had the tank, we found that his lines were completely plugged. The soil just sealed it in and it wasn't flushing out like it's supposed to. Hey, but that is a possibility of uh, using it as a subsurface irrigation system. Yes. Do you do anything special with your uh, tile lines for the repairing area? Do you use sock tile or anything for the clips? Do you? In some soils, they do put socks on, depending on how much you know, sand, silt, and clay content affects that. Again, I don't know the technology, what, which situations it's needed and which it isn't. There are some soils where you need to do that. Let's thank Harold. Thank you.